Hey guys, welcome back. This is episode nine of Rap Drinks. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm here, your host, Stefan. This is Bert, and today's guest is coming from us virtually from LA. His name is Josiah Van Dien. You've seen him probably on amazing some of his amazing work as a tour photographer. He's actually a freelance photographer now, doing a lot of great stuff. Thanks for coming on the show today, man. Uh, thanks for having me, guys. And uh, I just want to do a quick shout out to Charm City Meadworks out of Baltimore, Maryland. They gave us some drinks today, so... I'll be enjoying those. Cheers. Cheers. So we are really excited to have you on the show. And one of the things we talked about when we first had you on a meet and greet a week ago was your definition of tour photography and what you said it was that quote. And I want to start off because it was such a great quote you led us off with. Can you can you? Oh, yeah. That? It's uh, man, I think it was tour is just one big shitty rig, I believe is what, what the quote was. Yep. <laughs> Nice. Absolutely yeah. true. 2019 was the last year that I did like a full-time touring gig and I was gone 305 days. So you're traveling around the world, but you only have, uh, you have a carry on a backpack and a suitcase. That's pretty much all that you're all that you can take just cause you're flying so much. So it's like, you just have to have these like random gadgets that can fit in like that size. You know, so you can't bring like a backdrop, backdrop stands. You can't bring studio lights, you know, you can't have C stands. So you have all these like little mini light stands and like speed lights and you're gaff taping backdrops to a wall. Mm -hmm. I actually <laughs> one one of the photos I got to send you guys is of a of a backdrop gaff tape to a trailer, just a, a trailer from a bus. Nice. <laughs> That's yeah, we were, we had to do some portraits, and it was like, well, I guess I'll just run to a store and pick up a red backdrop, and then I couldn't find anywhere in the venue, and I didn't have any lights with me because it was last minute. So I was like, we got to do this outside, and then I was like, okay, I guess this trailer is the only place that has good lighting, so we're doing it here. <laughs> and what was that for? Was it's, that a specific? Uh, was that for Shawn Mendes at that at that time? That was for a band, um, the band Camino. So we were just doing, I wanted to get some portraits of them. I hadn't done any of them on that tour. Just wanted to get something like some nice, like individual portraits of the guys. Uh, so it was just these like plain red backdrop. I found a stool that was laying around the venue and had them sit on it. Yeah. Are you able to rely at all? Like when I, I would assume there's more than just the band that's traveling. It's like the lighting director or all the, the sound engineer, all, all those kind of people. Are you able to rely on those people at all to like steal gear from them or they only pack exactly what they're using for something else. So you're still on your own. Pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Like as far as like a show goes, you know, me and the LD are always best friends because that's the person that like is control in control of like, every photo that I would take, basically, you know, you got to find those moments that like, Hey, this is a great moment, but like, there's no light. You know, one of the perfect examples of that is when I was touring with Sean, the, at like the end, right before the end of the show, you know, there was a big confetti hit and CO2 that went off, but, and he jumped off of like the riser to like the bottom of the stage, but the first couple of times he did it, it was pitch black because it was like right before all the confetti hit. Mm -hmm. So I'm like talking to the LD. I was like, Hey man, like this looks cool. Like here's this photo that was in pitch black that I've just like, it's totally grainy and disgusting. I can't use it. Like, but it's him jumping in, in an arena. It looks awesome. What can we do about this? And he was like, Oh, I could just put like a narrow light above him just there and it won't ruin the rest of the effect. So it's all about like having a good relationship with your LD to, for like live stuff. But outside of that, as far as like portraits and behind the scenes and stuff like that, like you're 100% on your own. Yeah. And that's actually a really good point. Like how much of it is choreographed when you're trying to get some of these shots versus how much of it's on the, in the moment, you know, obviously he doesn't do the same exact thing every time, but if he's jumping from, you know, the stage, how much of that's choreographed, um, beforehand that, that really depends on the artist. Um, you know, I, I just did a couple of weeks with an artist named Maggie Rogers and there was no choreography. You know, she was just having a rock show doing her thing like every night. So that was very like, Oh shit, where's she going now? Okay. Uh, <laughs> you know, like that was, um, that was big, but like with Sean, you know, we were doing so many shows that like there was a bit of a routine and like his show was a lot more 
you know, it was a pop show. So we had, you know, two months of rehearsals. And so like, as far as like lighting goes and everything like that, it was the exact same show every night. Yeah. Um, other than like when he would decide to do new things during the show and we'd, you know, the LD would have to throw something together or like fix a couple things. You know, there was a couple of times when he was like, yo, I just want to run out into the crowd tonight. Um, <laughs> so like, <laughs> you got to get like a follow spot out there. And it's like, okay, well, like where in the crowd are you going to run? And he's like, I don't know. And we're just like, okay. <laughs> like, cause you have a whole arena floor. Yeah. Um, and like security is like, well, we can't just have that as an answer. Like we need to like, set up something so it's like all right cool like because there was a b stage on his tour so he was he sometimes he would just run out and you know it would just be mayhem because you you know you have a bunch of like 15 year old girls that like <laughs> don't have like the and sometimes sometimes they just don't they're, they're too in the moment and they don't realize like oh yeah i probably can't like jump over like three rows of chairs and this is illegal but they do yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so there's a lot of variables and stuff like that, but for the most part, like show wise, it, it was pretty consistent. What do you being the same thing? What do you keep in your kit for stuff like that? Like, what do you what do you have so that you can be so mobile and and ready to move at a, a moment's notice for the uh, these artists? The answer is not a lot. <laughs> um, I just a five D Mark IV, and then. I pretty much just have four lenses. I have a 24 to 70, which is like 99% of the time I'm shooting with that just because there's enough range on it. You know, I can get a wide shot or I can like zoom in and get a 70 and then like maybe have to crop in a little bit. Um, and then I have a 70 to 200, a what, 16 to 35. And then I have a 15 millimeter fisheye, which is rare, rarely used, but it comes out sometimes and it looks sick. <laughs> is it awesome. when you're jumping between venue, like if, if you've been to the same venue a couple of times or something like that, do you kind of look like, well, I already got these shots at that last show. I'm going to stick to this lens. I'm going to stay in the back of the crowd this time and I'm going to get a completely different set. Like, do you think about that when yeah. you're going from spot to spot? Yeah. All the time. I mean, especially with, with Sean's stuff, it was, you know, we did in 2019, I think we did 130 shows something like that. So, you know, about, you know, halfway through the year, I'm just like, I already did this. I have this shot 30 times, you know? So it's like, I feel like there was just like this internal, internal thought. Like I would just look down at my camera and just be like, I'm just going to do something that I like, what have I not done yet is basically like, it just gets into that mode of like, you have to, it's really challenging because you, you have, you only, you have the exact same set every day. Yeah. You know, that's the same lighting. This the, really, the only thing that changes is the roof height, which is, and like the roof color too. So it, it, that really depends on how bright the rest of the room is and how many like reflections are getting thrown on stage. But there's only a couple of venue like arenas in America where that really changes things. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, you pretty much, I pretty much just go through and I'm just like, where's a place on stage that I haven't been yet? Or where's a part of the venue that, you know, I haven't, haven't shot from, you know, you gotta, there was a couple of things in 2017 where we had a B stage, but all around it was, there wasn't, the seats weren't really close to the B stage. So when he would go out and perform, um, it would just kind of be a sea of kids around this circular stage. And I honestly saw a photo. I think I saw a photo on Instagram or someone in our camp showed us a photo from the nosebleeds of this shot that was just down on the, uh, on the B stage. And it just looked like he was like literally in a sea of fans. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you find honestly, fans are so creative in where, what they get from their show and it's really cool to like look at fan photos and see it's like oh wow like that person's in section you know f27 like maybe i'll do that you know go up there and shoot some stuff you know huh. so do you it do depends you, do you get free range of basically like the whole building when you're doing oh, something yeah. like that okay mm -hmm. the, um actually fun story you can't not in china other than china <laughs> go, yes go figure <laughs> <laughs> what yeah, happened in uh, china <laughs> 
you i wasn't allowed um so originally i wasn't going to be allowed to go like past the barricade so i wasn't allowed to go to front of house wasn't allowed to do anything other than just the barricade and i eventually got they allowed me to go to front of house and like do some stuff on the floor but i wasn't allowed in any of the upper seatings um uh, hmm. which was kind of weird there wasn't also a reason given to me it was just like no you can't go there it's like okay Interesting. Did you push those boundaries or did you just stay? No, no. <laughs> in China. No, he's, 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 he's on the call with us now. So you can tell he didn't get to. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it, I, I'm sure that for a long time, I'll be on some sort of a watch list because you have to, when you go into China as a photographer, you have to sign a bunch of paperwork and like write down your social media and like all that stuff so that they can like look through, you basically sign some stuff that like says, you know, if you, post something that like defames the government like you're never going to be allowed back in type really yeah, um, yeah. whoa that's which i don't have anything we were just shooting a show <laughs> like yeah. it's like it was one of those things i'm looking at this i'm like what do they think i'm gonna do here like <laughs> just there's a concert and i'm gonna take pictures of it like what <laughs> one, one guy ruined it for all of us man that's oh that's oh awesome. i'm sure yeah <laughs> Were so, you were you ever worried of like any photos that you took that might get interpreted that way? Like, did that worry you at all? Or were you just like, whatever, I'm not. I'm, or did you have like some weird fear in the back? I mean, of that, that that's solely related to publicly doing that. So, like, yeah, there are photos that I don't know when I would ever post. So, basically, how how that concert looked was, you know, just a normal arena. There's a bowl and then a floor. So around the the entire floor between the seats and the upper sections, there was police arm to arm. Wow. So I have a lot of very interesting photos of like a concert happening and kids being like just happy and, you know, and thoroughly enjoying this moment with like, you know, a hundred police in the background. Mm -hmm. So I didn't, I didn't, I haven't really ever shared any of those images because I would like to go back to China and I don't know how that would be interpreted, <laughs> you know, because it, it is one of those things where it's like, they're, they're great images, but I don't. So we won't post them on the show. Like, <laughs> yeah. It mostly was just like other show, like in, we didn't in sign this anyone. very specific moment, it's weird because, you know, you have, I don't know. It, it's just weird. It's just different cultures. Like I don't, uh, I don't necessarily see anything wrong with it because of how they decide to live their, you know, their country wants to run or, however their government wanted to run it but kids got still got to see a show yeah which is better than other countries where they wouldn't even allow him to go in the first place mm -hmm. so i don't know it's a yeah weird political thing. <laughs> right so you you said you you travel with one camera you don't have a backup or anything like that no no what, not at all what what happens if you know a, a fan just go buy you, another one right that's it it's there's just, a camera it's, store and ever yeah Wow. Okay. There's a camera store in every city. Okay. And, you, you know, have you had any issues or any time where you've been on, um, you know, a, a ready to shoot and something fails with your oh, equipment? Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> All the time. Um, I had, so I used to shoot with a Canon 60, um, for the longest time. I loved it. I thought it had, you know, it, the grain on it was great. Um, it was, it wasn't, as good of a camera as everyone else was using. So it just kind of like made the camera, made the photos a little bit like grittier. Um, but uh, I was in rehearsal for, to start a tour and the, um, the shutter window or like the, the blades on the shutter jammed up. So, you know, yeah, I just went to a camera store and bought a new 5D Mark IV. Cause by that time, a uh, 60 was, six seven years old yeah um but uh actually i've run into the problem where i can't register it uh through canon because it's in the uk so i have to i can't just like mail it in to service it <laughs> they're like you got to ship this to uk and i'm like no yeah. <laughs> <It's>, what? <laughs> that's great yeah do you have any weird like not to compare i mean Maybe, yeah, to compare, uh, like wedding photographers, every single different wedding photographer has like this one weird signature shot where like they find a puddle wherever the wedding is and they're like, shoot a yeah. reflection. Do you, do you have like any weird things that you like always go out of your way to try to like, this is going to be a cool shot. Let's try to find something in this back room where we can do 
Absolutely. I mean, as far as live photos, absolutely. I think that it's it's really important to capture the size of the room that you're shooting in. And it's, it's really easy to do with arenas. And especially on the last tour we did, I did with Sean, we had um, basically these uh, LED bracelets that everyone got when they came in the door and they were all synced to the show. Mm -hmm. So they would light up at different moments. So it created this, like, you could just actually see how big the venue was. And I always thought that was like super important. Um, and also like the, the huddle right before walking on stage. I think that's always like a cool thing because it's just this moment where everyone's like super amped. They're really excited to, to get going and doing a show. And there's always, there's always like everyone's super amped. And then there's just this moment of calm where everyone's just like, quiet reflecting and then they're like all right sick let's go <laughs> and then they go on stage and everyone's excited the <laughs> crowd's going crazy i don't know there's like i always view music photography as how do you get access you know they're let me rephrase that how the important part of music photography is access because Concert photos are one thing because you can go and buy a ticket. That's the only thing stopping you from getting it and seeing a show is the cost of a ticket or like actually finding them if they're sold out. Um, but Master? yeah, <laughs> I wasn't sure if you guys are sponsored or not. At it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we understand. So there's that. And then like backstage stuff, you know, you can, I know plenty of people that really aren't into music that, you know, can get backstage, you know, they have friends that, you know, can get them in or whatnot. Like there isn't, it, it's a pretty big barrier, but like, it's not an impossible barrier mm -hmm. to overcome. And then there's recording studio, which is the level of no one's invited. Like you, you're the only person that's there. That's not working on this project, like this song. Mm -hmm. And that's like, that's how I feel about like, moments and like doing things um so i think like on the concert side you know the backstage stuff is like cool but it's it's finding the moments that like no one no one's able to be around for so it, it's really just a glimpse in this life of that that no one else is going to be able to see so you know like dressing room stuff it's really cool because you know there's only a couple people that really ever get to experience that and and being with an artist in that environment so how do you, as a photographer, how did you create that access as you were first starting to get into working with bands? I know you worked with Pierce the Veil and this, when you first started off, you were in a band and you, know, you, you started asking permission to record, but how did you create that access for yourself? MySpace. <laughs> I, I, you just put all the I bands can't. in your top eight? You dated yourself with that <laughs> one. So I had, I was in a band in high school and when we were like breaking up, I ended up getting, I, I don't know if like we were arguing about money or like something. There was a couple things like on the table that like people were trying to get a hold of. And I was like, look, I'll just grab the MySpace. Like, that's fine. You know, cause I did a lot of work on that to like, you know, I think we had like 10,000 friends on MySpace, which was like a lot of friends at the time, you know? And, and then I took that and I turned that into a photography page and it it kind of opened up these doors where I was messaging bands that were coming to Florida and it was, they were like, yeah, like, cool. We'll give you a photo pass mm -hmm. because it was weird because like, I don't even think to this day I've ever gotten a photo pass through a magazine or something like that. You know, I know a lot of people that created their own blogs and their own magazines and stuff like that. And I just never did that. I, I literally just always hit up a band on social media. Um, cause there's always the guy who always is like sitting on the band's, you know, account doesn't care. They're just like, Oh, that's cool. Yeah. yeah. So it's like publicists have like a high threshold for letting people for giving people photo passes, but the dude sitting in a van on a 10 hour drive doesn't care. <laughs> he was, he's always just like, yeah, sure. This kid wants to do some photos. And then I would kind of get my foot in the door. And you, I really understood like how the timing of someone on tour's day would work, you know? So they would get to the venue at like noon, anywhere between like noon and three. 
and then they'd load in, they'd sound check, and then they have like four or five hours to kill before they would go on stage. Mm-hmm. So I'd always show up in that time and I, they'd just be hanging out and be like, Hey, like I'm that guy that, you know, you got a photo for photo pass for later. Like, would you mind if I just hung out and took some photos of you, photos of you guys while you're hanging out? And most of them were cool. They're just be like, yeah, sure. Like what's good to eat around here. And I'd be like, Oh, there's a great taco place right down the street. Like you guys want to go. And you kind of just built relationships that, or I built relationships that way. Um, which I know, I feel like would be impossible nowadays to just hit someone up on Instagram without really having a following, um, or any like sort of work history, but yeah, that was like 2010. So it was a lot different. Yeah. So it kind of gives you a different, um, look at uh, at the photos right because a lot of these photographers would go in and you just see them playing their instruments or you know with the crowd but you're out here yeah. getting photos of them eating tacos before they even go on stage which i think is pretty <laughs> cool i think there was a handful of times when like i made i made some friends and then one time before i really ever started touring you know florida living in florida was an advantage because there were four cities that everyone could possibly go to, you know, there's Jacksonville, Orlando, Fort Lauderdale slash Miami Mm -hmm. and Tampa. So it was always going to be routed. You know, you'd have, they've had four shows in a row. Mm -hmm. So I would like hop on a mega bus from Orlando where I lived in like college and go to Jacksonville and then sit and then ride for like two or three days and get to do that sort of stuff. Um, so it was like a handful of stepping stones along the way where like, you know, and most of those bands were like, well, it's only three days. So if he sucks, he's just going to leave on Sunday. So like, who cares? <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> that's got to be a but, commitment financially to say that you're going to pull the trigger and, and, you know, work on a job that, I mean, I don't know when you're first starting off, are you even making enough to survive? No, off of? I so, wasn't, I wasn't getting paid at all for most of the stuff I did for the first handful of years. I mean, the first tour I ever did, I was getting paid 10 bucks a day just in per diems. Wow. Um, and that was, but that was only for like two weeks, you know, it was like a last minute. Uh, it was just like a, I went, I was in Tampa hanging out with a band that I was somewhat friends with pretty good friends with actually. And then they, they were like, yo, we have two weeks left of this tour. You want to just come and we'll fly you home. And I was like, sure. And I just left my car in Tampa and hopped in a, a airport shuttle van. Nice. <laughs> That they had tricked out with bunks in it. It was great. How many of you were in that van? Um, there were, I think there was 10 altogether. Wow. There was like seven people in that band. It was, they had a singer, a screamer, a keyboard player, two guitarists, a bassist, and a drummer. Oh wow. my God. <laughs> when, when, right. what, what's a screamer? A screamer? Yeah. Uh, like metal bands, uh, they just scream and, what? Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, oh, yeah. John, come on. I'm so unfamiliar. I'm sorry. Wow. <laughs> That's pretty cool. It's, I, it's the it's the metal version of a hype man for like a rap artist. Ah, okay. It's, it's flavor, it. flavor, metal, flavor, flavor. <laughs> like, I don't know. Why not? Um, that's great. incredible you for that context when yeah. when when you're when you're like living with a band like that you're going on tour with them you're traveling around with them are you um just even for yourself are you going out of your way to try to take photos like on the off days or are you specifically you're only there for the shows that really depends on the artist um when i was doing like van tours and stuff like that early on yeah we were any day off you know we weren't even getting hotels like we would so one of their friends would let us stay or like something like that so we were always pretty much together mm-hmm. and then and then when you, the artist gets bigger i mean it kind of turns into just your everyday life so you know when it, when you have a day off you don't really do much you know mm-hmm. sometimes you go out you know and do some sightseeing but mm-hmm. for the most part it's like oh yeah we just did five shows in a row we have a day off like i'm sleeping Right. So like if the artist isn't really doing anything, then you don't really have to. And also it depends, like sometimes they just want to be alone, you know? So it's, you're really just, you're just on call 24 seven. So how was that transition for you from heavy metal band to Shawn Mendes? Hilarious. (laughs) Um, 
I actually turned down the job originally. Like, uh, I just got done. I started, well, I went from doing metal stuff to ended up getting into like more like pop punk, like pop rock. Um, and then, and then I went and started working for Sean. Um, so it was, it was interesting because the first tour I ever did with him, you know, he was 16 years old and playing an acoustic guitar. Like that was it. No band. It was just a teenager and an acoustic guitar. So like for me, it was completely different from anything that I had ever shot, you know, versus bands that are, you know, punk jumping on stage, jumping off of the drum set, you know, head banging, you know, some of them will jump into the crowd, you know, you have a, it's a very different energy level. Mm -hmm. So when I started touring with him, it was kind of challenging because there wasn't, you know, you're just sta it's someone standing in front of a microphone, just playing. There's not, there's nothing else. So you like, I really had to push myself to find cool moments to capture while, cause it, you do have a, an insane fan crowd. You know, they're, they're all teenagers that are all going crazy over a heartthrob. So it's, you have these weird moments or not weird, but interesting moments. Is that transition so, from like, for heavy metal, you're focusing on the band and all they're doing versus when you go to pop, you're kind of focused on the the crowd because the, the, those fans are the ones that are giving more necessarily uh, than his. Yeah, I, th I think it's more of you're focusing on the environment. Um, I think because, I mean, what what's the difference between someone who's a massive pop star and just someone who's a singer? You know, it, it really is the crowd and and the people that are around him and how many people are interacting with him. So that's, so the fans really do make such a big difference in that like environment. So yeah, like there is, it's a, it's a lot more context, I think, than just, oh yeah, these are these dudes playing, you know, a 500 cap venue mm -hmm. yeah. to a bunch of sweaty guys that are moshing. <laughs> <laughs> Which also leads to interesting photos. Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> it's got to have some interesting photos. I'm curious about oh, yeah. the I'm curious about the photo you mentioned in the in the conversation we had a week ago. The one that's in your bathroom, I think, that is a billboard. Oh, yeah. So um there was I I was looking to try and see if I could find the billboard, but it didn't end up I couldn't find one of it. Um but yeah, so we had a show in Sean was opening up for Taylor Swift at the time. And we had a show in Seattle where, and out of nowhere management was like, Hey, like we need a, a photo of him just like for, it, it was for two things. It was for cardboard cutouts. You know, when you go to like FYE and there's like those random cardboard cutouts you can buy it's for those. <laughs> um, and I think they used it on like, I don't know if it was a Spotify billboard or something, something along those lines. Um, and I only had, I had two speed lights and I got a white sheet from catering, uh, like a tablecloth. So I only, the wall was pretty white. It was like white tile. So it wasn't, it was easy enough to Photoshop out, but the ground was, um, like a brick, like a reddish brick. So I definitely needed to cover that up. So yeah, I had this, uh, it was basically just like a little psych wall, like nothing, you know, nothing great, but I, I brought the, I brought the cloth up a little bit on the wall so that, you know, there wasn't anything and then just fired the flash off a handful of times. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was pretty easy to stitch him out. And then I just made the rest of the file white. <laughs> it's great. But yeah, it's, it's weird because you have, so like, since I only had two speed lights, I couldn't really light it. I didn't even have an umbrella or anything like that. So I just used the bounce of the shower to create like a very full body, you know, lighting setup. Huh. Did you know yeah. that that photo would end up on a billboard? Yes, sort of. I mean, I knew that it was going, I knew what they wanted to use it for. Um, but it had to be good enough that they could actually use it. 
so that was the the kicker you know it's like yeah like we can rent a studio in a couple of weeks and do this or we could just do this today let's right. see and then i did it and it was good enough and wow. they ran with it since you since you're photograph like since you're photographing the same thing over and over and over again sometimes like do you ever find not like a not like a throwaway day but is there like a day where I don't know. You're just like, I'm going to put a stocking over my lens. Like, do you, do you ever do any of those like oh, weird old school techniques, like Vaseline on a filter or something? Like, do you go out of your uh, way to like fuck with shit like that? Or is it kind of like, I need to have this high quality just in case. I can say that I have unfortunately dabbled with star filters. Um, <laughs> I, I wasn't a fan immediately, you know, you yeah. know that like, that mean that's just like immediately no like yeah. like no <laughs> um yeah i did that once it wasn't i didn't enjoy it um i think star filters as a whole you know it's if you need a gimmick to make your photo look good it's not a good photo is like how i always view it you know and i'm not not dissing anyone it's just more so in my personal taste for my work you know it's like that's if i needed something that's gimmicky you know adding there's definitely times like long time ago when like i had like light leak overlays and it's like you look back on that it's like that doesn't make any sense like why would you have light leak in this photo like the sun's behind you it doesn't like right. that <laughs> you know so like that's i feel like i had one of those moments and that was just like oh yeah like that's stupid but i definitely I do that with film every now and again, you know, it's just like I'm having a weird day and there's always, because there's like a delay in like getting your film back. I feel like it's a lot easier just to like shoot something that's not, not what you've done before. It kind of forces you to think about it more. It forces you to, to really contrive an image because you don't have, you only have 36 shots mm -hmm. to work with. So, and it's going to cost, I don't know, what's up to like 40 bucks now to get a roll of film and it developed and scanned. Um, and on top of that, you're going to wait a week if you're on tour right. to get it back. So you got to mail it somewhere. Um, right. Is that a request you get from artists to use film or why would you use film? Yeah. Yeah. It depends. Why did you choose to stick with photography? rather than doing also doing videography because i know at one point you did both um and what was that decision process for you just to choose one versus the other i think it was an ego thing you know i had when i started out touring i got into it because of video um growing up i used to just make like jackass videos with my friends um and i think i think i i think i torrented premiere when I was in like seventh grade, something like that. Nice. And so I was fairly familiar with how to use the software. And, and then in high school, I took TV production classes and I, um, I ended up actually teaching my first TV production teacher how to edit video. What? Um, That's pretty cool. Yeah. She, so the, the high school that I went to was a brand new school the year that I started going there. So she had just come from like an actual news station. And they, they still did everything linear. So they were still using tapes. They were still using all that stuff. So they never, they weren't doing anything wow. digital um, cause they were still using GL twos uh, for everything. So I, she was like, I don't know what happened. I think like the first or second week of school, I was like, Hey, like, can I come in on my lunch break and use the editing bay? And she was like, Oh, like, I don't know. That's really like a TV production two like thing. Like that's when we really get into editing. And I was like, Oh, like I've been editing for a couple of years now. You know, like I know how to use premiere, like it's fine. And she was like, okay. Yeah. And then she like was in the editing room and like kind of watching me, making sure I wasn't breaking some shit. And then like started like, wait, so what are you doing here? Like, how is this? <laughs> and then, and then I just was coming in, like I was literally editing videos of us running shopping carts into you know bushes while we were sitting in them and she's just like oh cool so you can stitch this here and that and i'm like yeah and then I, ignoring and then the I content this, like, yeah yeah and then i'm like putting a lamb of god song on it and and it's like oh okay like 
yeah, you can just turn that down a little bit. I don't need to hear that, <laughs> but yeah. So I ended up like, so like when, when the five D Mark two came out and it had video on it, I feel like that gave me an advantage because like I had a basic knowledge of how to do this and like everyone else pretty much knew how to shoot video, but they didn't know how to edit it. And then, you know, fast forward, I don't know, seven, eight years later, you know, everyone's doing these like crazy drone shots and, you know, all these like just insane edits that like I never kept up with, you know, like I didn't, I didn't really spend a lot of time like relearning and and staying on top of like the culture of like video editing. And, and it was just kind of one of those things where it's like, I just, I'm just not a good editor. Mm -hmm. And, and that's where then I just kind of gave up, not gave up, but it was like, you have to know what you're good at. And, and there's still plenty of times that like I shoot video and I, um, and direct stuff, but you just gotta, you gotta hire someone to do the stuff you're not good at. Yeah. So in, in, in your line of work now, are you more of like a one man band kind of thing? Like you, you shoot, edit everything, like the video, the photos at least like it's, that really depends on the budget of the job. You know, if, if I can get a budget that I can hire an editor, then I'm not doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm sending it to someone. Um, and it also depends on like my passion for the project. You know, there's, I shot a music video in January where it was just one of my best friends. You know, he has a really small unsigned indie project that like, I just think it's good. I think he's an incredible musician and the song was great. And he was like, yo, I got like, a grand to spend on a music video. What do you want to do? And I'm like, cool, let's rent out this space. You know, let's, let's just do it. And I edited that and I thought that was really fun, you know, cause it was just, I didn't, you know, January's are always slow yeah. and I was just doing something for fun. But like, there's another, I did another video that month that, you know, I didn't edit it at all. I shot it, directed it, and then sent a hard drive to someone and sent them notes. And I'm like, that's way easier. I, you know, yeah. I'm not, it depends. Um, but as far as photos go, I pretty, yeah, I edit most of my own photos. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's like on the spot, right? Like, so if you're, if you're on stage, I think I heard in another interview did is you'll take photos and you'll edit it as you go. Yeah. That, so with Sean, that's what I was doing. You know, I had, I did have a work box on that tour um, and it, it basically flipped up. And I could set up my computer there because like with him, it, it really depends on like what time zone we were in. Um, you know, when we're in America, I mean, you, it's kind of weird because you're, you're trying to always sell tickets for the next show. So when we're in America, it doesn't really matter the crazy fast turnaround time because most of your audience is already asleep and they're not going to get it until the morning anyway. But when you're in Europe, it's 6 p.m. or it's midnight there and it's 6 p.m. in New York, which is like the perfect time to be posting photos. Uh, so so on like during the show, you know, I guess I guess that goes more more for my process is while I'm shooting, I'm flagging the photos in camera so that when I import it, I don't have to go through all of them on my computer. I've already gone through them. You know, and if I get to one that's flagged and it's not right, I'll just look around, you know, it for the next couple of frames and see if there's actually a better one. Yeah. But for the most part, I'm just picking everything in camera because it's just way quicker when you're dealing with that many photos. You know, I I take about a thousand photos during, you know, a two hour set. You know, it's it's impossible, not impossible, but it's very time consuming to just sit down and start going through a thousand to two thousand photos yeah. at once. But if you do it as you're shooting it, it's a lot easier. You know, there's always downtime. The person's talking. There's always, you know, a minute or two that you can look back through the last song of photos and be like, oh, that one's great. Eh. Yeah. You know, and figure out which ones you really liked so that when you're editing, it's just like, great, cool. Here's a hundred of them already <laughs> done. Let me start editing them. So, yeah, there was I didn't. It was more so just like flagging and, and figuring out which ones I was going to edit during his set. Um, there's some of them that sometimes, you know, if it was a slow show or he was talking a lot, I would, 
I would just start editing because it's easier, you know, so he could have a couple <laughs> right when he walks off stage. Um, so I'm, I'm curious now. So you've you've um, decided you wanted to focus more on photography than, than necessarily doing uh, videography. Um, what was your inspiration? Did you have other photographers that, that inspire you to get these amazing shots? Like who inspires you today? That's a interesting question. I think like I look back at like Jim Marshall and Danny Clinch and like people like that as like they knew what they were doing because that was like they have these insane photos of like I don't know. I mean Danny Clinch took that Rolling Stones cover of Tupac. You know, that's like one of my favorite photos in the world. And it, it's just this iconic photo that like, I'm sure you can close your eyes and you know exactly what photo I'm talking about. You know, it's like th things like that when like, you know, Jim Marshall, it's like the, oh my gosh, the Johnny Cash photo, you know, in that prison where he's like flicking off the camera. It's like, we all just know those photos, you know, like, I couldn't, I couldn't, I mean, actually, no, I couldn't name a Johnny Cash song, but you know, it's like, I don't know anything about Johnny Cash, but I know that photo because it's just iconic. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's more so what I love about photography is that it's something that is super important to the branding of a musician and like the fame of a musician, but unless you're a photo nerd, you have no idea who these people are and you don't, you don't care. It's like, it's this weird nameless person that just kind of exists that gets to do all this cool shit with the artist, but they're not famous. They're not, I mean, in two certain people, they are, but for the most part, they're just a random person. And I feel like I look at that as like, I want to do that. I want to just create these like iconic images that, will stand the test of time even though it's social media and there's everyone has the attention span of like 10 seconds <laughs> um, so it's trying to figure out how to how to work with that to get all these amazing shots i want to know some of the crazy stories of situations you might have been in i know one time we talked last week you were talking about how you almost got ran over by security to get a, a shot of sean on the steps with these, you know, crazy fans trying to all grab at him. I want to hear those stories. I want to hear any of those you have of like those crazy things you had to have done those war stories to get the amazing shots. Europe's crazy. Like <laughs> a lot of the fans in Europe are just wild, but Brazil is like this next level, like crazy. Why? Where, I don't know why. I, I don't, I don't know. I don't think anyone knows. <laughs> Like how many times have you just been on Twitter and seen come to Brazil trending? Like, I don't know if that's just niche to my music algorithm that exists, but like come to hashtag come to Brazil is just crazy. And, and every time you show up, they're just crazy. Like they will, there'll be a thousand kids at the airport just wow going crazy. There's no, and there's like, they're super nice, super respectful, but like, there's just so many of them that like, it's just like, oh, like how it becomes a logistical problem of like, how do we get to our car? Because there's this many people in between us and the car <laughs> and they're not moving until they get a picture with the artist. And, and you have to navigate that because at the end of the day, there's a lot of like, I'm a kidnap risk because no one's going to kidnap the artist, but they could kidnap me and ask the artist for money. Um, so it's like in those situations, like you're like, I hope Sean you have, likes like you, you want to be, I, I hope so too. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there's insurance for that, you know? <laughs> um, but uh, so like a lot of those situations when like, there's these really beautiful um, moments happening with the artists and, and the fans, like that looks really cool from the fans perspective. And, but it becomes problematic because then you have to go into the fans and how they move. They just, it's a mob mentality. So like if he moves 10 feet, they're moving 20 feet to get in front of him so that they'll see him. They'll be the next person to interact with him. Yeah. So it's like, you, I feel like I I've like created this like insane um, spatial awareness because of it, because like so <laughs> many times, like 
I mean, when it started, like at the beginning of his career, like when I wasn't in pop music at all, like I didn't know, like no one ever cared. Like no one was ever sitting outside of a hotel for like the bands that I had toured with before. So it's like you create this weird situational awareness where you're just like you you're predicting what this mob's about to do and you're figuring out how to counteract that so that you're safe. It's it's a weird, I don't know. <laughs> Anything in particular that's, the weird that's popped out for you that's like I mean, really stuck out? We, Sean got sick once and he canceled a show in, in Brazil. Um, and, and there was, there was like, they shut down the street in front of our hotel because there were so many kids outside. Wow. And, and, um, I gotta, I know, I know that I'll have a photo of this, but it's a photo of him waving at the crowd. And, and it's just this like crazy moment where these kids are, you know, we had a, 50,000 people that had bought tickets to the show that now don't get to see it. And, you know, it's not like, it's not like he's playing, you know, in LA where like we could just reschedule that at any time. You know, yeah. we, we had, I want to say we had like 13 shipping containers, you know, boated there. Whoa. So it's like, it's not like we can just like come back next week. So it's a, it, not on top of it already being like these passionate fans, like, they're now like heartbroken, passionate fans. And like, they were like, they sat outside our hotel and sang songs until like two, three in the morning. <laughs> Did so you take it's, photos it's, of that stuff? Did you take photos of that yeah. out there? Oh, for sure. I mean, to an extent, I, I know that a bit of that, like I have some photos from like the hotel roof with um, all of those fans like sitting outside. And then it's, it's kind of like, when you go out or when he would go out and like take photos, you know, they would, some of them would line up, some of them wouldn't, but yeah, you, you're kind of just in that mess of like, you know, 200 to a thousand people just in a mob. It's like a, a Jesus like photo, you know, where, when like you have these kids that are just like reaching out, like just trying to like, Oh, I touched him. Like, you know, and you have these like crazy expressions on these kids' faces because like they're never, they're probably never going to be that close to him ever again. Yeah. So it's, it's like this weird uh, euphoria that these kids have because they're, there's, it's just an insane moment that they'll always remember. Is, is there any kind of dialogue between you and the artists about like you telling him, Hey, maybe you try this tonight. We can get a cool shot or him telling you like, Hey, I think I'm going to try this tonight. See, make sure you're over here so you can get this cool shot kind of thing. Like, do you guys talk about oh, that yeah. before shows? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, definitely. Like I was telling earlier with the, the jumping, that was like, Hey, I think I'm going to try this. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, cool. So what you're going to want to do is pull your knees up as far as you can, because you know, I had toured with like punk bands yeah. and, and I'm like, it looks so much cooler if your feet are like tucked. And like having weird conversations like that, where it's like, I have this weird niche knowledge of, of something and he wants to do it. Or like, I mean, with, you know, going out in the crowd situations like that. Um, I think other things were like, the, we, he had a trap door on stage. So it's a lot of that stuff also has to do with communicating with your crew um, that you want to do certain things mm -hmm. um, with that trap door, you know, it, everyone has in, in ears in and pretty much except for me. Um, so they have like a show comms channel where someone's calling like certain things that are happening. So like when that door opens, they did, they did guitar changes through it. Mm -hmm. um, so when that would happen, you know, it would be an all call, you know, stage door open so that anyone on stage wouldn't walk into it and fall and hurt themselves. Right. So it's like, you have to, and it would usually only be open for like 10 or 20 seconds. Um, so I would have to like talk to like three different people to be able to get them to open it to, for me to pop out and take a couple photos and then close it. But it could only be during certain moments where they knew, cause like that all call is going to everyone else other than Sean. Right. From what I understand, I'm not sure if that's in his ears or not. So he knows when that's opened already. So if we were going to open it without him knowing, it would have to be a moment where like he's stuck at the mic right. and not wandering around stage. 
So you have to, you have to have like a lot of communication with your crew and be like, Hey, I'm going to be here at this moment. And it's like, Oh no, no, don't because we're firing. We have pyro that happens and you'll be too close to that and you'll get burnt. Same thing with like CO2. It's like, Hey, like you have to know when those things are going off. And if you want to be somewhere specific, you know, you can talk to your guy and be like, Hey, can we turn that jet off for this one and do other things like that? So it's, yeah, there's so much communication that goes on when you, when you're at like a big pop show like that. Um, have you ever, yeah. have you ever been in a situation where you, you got all that information ahead of time and then you just miscalculated by like a second and then you just missed the shot and then you had yeah. to say that to the artist, like, what's that conversation <laughs> yeah. like? Well, so that that's one of the main, that specifically is why I stopped doing video on a tour because I mean, there were so many times, you know, I'm, I was running with a a7s2 on a gimbal and my camera in the other hand and you know management would or artists would be like hey like did you get a photo of this and i would be like no i got a video of it though or the other way around you know i got a great photo of it but i didn't get a video and they're like man i wish we got a video of that and it's like i can only do so much man <laughs> yeah. you got two hands like, it was never yeah they, like they were never like mad at me but they were just like man, that, that would have looked great in the, in the other format. And it's like, well, then we got to just get a video guy. Like, let's just get someone to do that all the yeah. time. And then, then we can both, we can have both. Right. And, and once you get to like a big enough budget, like that's fine. Um, but, and yeah, there's, there's plenty of times with like photos that like, you know, I've missed people propo getting proposed to like in the front row because, you know, they didn't tell us it was just, you're not there. They, for them. Yeah. they have their special song, you know, and it's like, I'm up in the balcony taking wide shots of the whole venue. And, and you just hear, Oh my God, you guys just get engaged. Oh, come up on stage. And you're like, dude, it's a, it's a 10 minute walk for me to get to, <laughs> back down there. Like, like I'm missing this. Like this just isn't happening. Like it, there's no point in me even trying because he's bringing these guys up on stage. And by the time I get down there, they're all already be halfway through the next song. <laughs> so there's, there's plenty of times, but I mean, it, it's, it's tour, you know, it's you, you're, you're documenting something. So there's only so much that you can get. There's only so much you can do, you know, I feel like when I was younger, I would have beat myself up about that stuff. But like now being healthier, it's like, yeah, like shit just happens. I don't know. Like right. sometimes you're there for it. Sometimes you're not. And, and at the same time, sometimes you're there for it and you get the most insane shots, you know, it, it, it just really depends on right, right place, right time. And knowing enough about your circumstances that you can try and try and be there. Yeah. Do you, you know how when you like this is this is a very left hand turn I'm gonna make. Uh when you like pause a TV, you have never paused a TV on like a a, a good face. Do you have like oh a, yeah, do you have a file in your computer of just <laughs> ugly shots of like things that you you can never publish, but like this is for me and oh, I'm gonna show it to yeah. all my friends. Like Especially I, I mean like, I want I that as like a coffee table book. Like, <laughs> All right. Um, I will give you 10% right now for that. <laughs> we That's got it on, we idea. got it on film guys. <laughs> um, but, did, but did we get it on photo? Right. <laughs> Ooh, facts. Um, no, there's, Oh yeah. I, I don't have like any specific save somewhere. Like I don't have a filing system for them, mm -hmm. but yeah, there's some photos that like, you know, there's so much going on on stage that like, yeah, you know, you're, middle of like a ah, like right you, no one's making a great face when they're whipping their head around like you, your cheeks are uh, what's the you remember that some 41 album cover where they're just like oh, oh. yeah <laughs> yeah it's like that like they're just in the middle of like you know head banging it's, it's gonna look bad you gotta find the right face i guess that um, that works for punk bands it doesn't really work for pop right like that's about yeah. like it, it, you know it's a different it's a different yeah. uh like persona they want to put on it, you know? Yeah. And, and it's also like, there's a huge difference between shooting men and women on it because, you know, a guy is going to be way like, obviously depending on the artist. Um, but you know, 
I've worked with female artists where it's like, oh, I look so sweaty in this. And it's like, well, you are. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. What do you want me to do about that? Like you have sweat dripping down your face. You've been dancing and singing for the last hour and a half. Mm. It, anyone would. Uh, and then, you know, there's some, you know, there's some artists where it's like, they want that. They want, you know, to look sweaty. Um, so it, it, that really depends like artist to artist is like what you can do with those. Do you have any other times that you've had to shitty rig or make a shitty rig um, for some of these um, shots that you would do on tour? Yeah. I mean, actually one, I think one of my, like one of my most used shitty rigs isn't technically a shitty rig. It's just a really shitty camera. Um, I, a handful of times over the last couple of years, I've just been using a, um, it's a Canon power shot elf 350. So it's, it's just a little point and shoot from like, I don't know, 2010, 2011. That's like, it's 20 megapixels, just shoots in JPEG, but it's this like, I don't know. It just, it kind of looks like a film. Like if you know what you're doing with it and know how to edit it, you can get it pretty close to looking like, you know, a point and shoot film photo, but you don't have to develop it. You know, it's just an SD card. And that was like, I could, I could send you guys a handful of photos of that, but um, yeah, it's just this like weird little camera that like looks pretty good. And everyone's just shocked that like, Oh wait, you shot that on, on that. Okay. Um, that's a big one. Um, I, I was developing film on for a little bit on tour, just black and white. So like I had to, I mean, that was just one shitty rig. Like I had a, you have to like heat up all the chemicals to one to like a certain temperature. So like I got a, an electric kettle and was like <laughs> using that from catering to like heat up water, to <laughs> heat up the chemicals. And then like, you had to like, none of the, like, if you're in a, most of the arenas, you're in a locker room. Um, so like, I got to like call a janitor to turn the lights off so that I don't like ruin any of this. Nice. <laughs> and, and then you're using a, a literal bag, like instead of, cause like sometimes you can't get the janitor and they won't turn the lights off or there's like giant gaps under the door. So like to transfer the film into a canister, you know, you, there's literally just a bag that you're like, you stick your arms in and it has like multiple like clasps on it. You're just like fiddling around in the dark. Um, I think clamps are like that. Um, I for, I, I want to say it just Manfrotto makes a, a clamp that has a, uh, it has a um, what eighth inch quarter inch uh, screw on the, like tripod head screw on it. And so many times have I just like, you know, got this clamp and like clamped it to the top of like a pipe and drape to put it a camera in the green room mm -hmm. um, to like do some video of just like everyone getting ready and everyone doing their machine or their like, you know, warm ups, whatnot, um, and just do like time lapses of things. Um, and then you can also use that to put a hot shoe mount for a, uh, um, a speed light. And, and yeah, I don't know. I feel like so much gaff tape, <laughs> just so much gaff tape. Um, so that, there we go. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about what you would have as part of your setup. If you're, you know, giving the advice to young touring photographers, what it should be in their kit. It's so weird because like, it really depends on what you want to focus on. You know, I never really focused a lot on um, studio lighting. So a lot of that stuff, mostly because when I was younger and doing it, a lot of that stuff was so bulky that like you couldn't travel with it. So for me, you know, I couldn't, I had a pro photo pack, you know, I think I had the acute like 2400, um, but I couldn't bring that on tour because like it wasn't, I mean, it was an entire Pelican case on its own, you know, so you couldn't. I just didn't have room for it. So I had to use speed lights, which are great. And nowadays, like, you know, Profoto makes a speed light that's incredible. And they also make um, 
was it the B ones that are all battery and you know it's this big and it'll fit in a back they it literally comes in a backpack versus all the other ones when I was younger you know so there are so many more options now for like lightweight gear that that are just great I don't know yeah so it's hard to really um, determine what you would necessarily need besides yeah a good camera like for me lenses. my yeah it's so like for me it was like I always you know did speed lights and I had a a little octobox you know it's about this big I think it I think it's like I think it's like 20 22 inches something like that just like a little little speed light on a on a clamp basically that sometimes I would have it on a on a stand but most of the time my stand was in my suitcase on the bus so I just didn't feel like walking so I'd just be holding it or get someone else to hold it <laughs> that's great um human tripods that's that is one of the best shitty rigs is just or sorry a human light stand is always comes in clutch hey we hold this for a second and then the person's just like ah shit yeah. i got sucked into this again <laughs> <laughs> they try to avoid then, you then you're on their shoulder oh yeah taking another as photo. soon as soon as someone sees me walk in with with something in my hand they're like fuck <laughs> <laughs> get away get away yeah um, uh, i'm actually curious i have kind of a two-part question about uh, while we're talking about tech earlier you were talking about a point and shoot um so first part is, what is your feeling on like the sort of resurgence of point and shoot cameras? I feel like that's become very trendy in the last year or two, especially with like influencers and stuff. Like how, how have you seen that as like, you know, obviously we come from that era when point and shoots were just like the way to get instant digital photos. Like what's your feeling on it, seeing it now becoming so popular? Are you just kind of like, oh, well, like, you know, like a fogey, like, oh, well, that's, that's, that was back from my day. Or are you kind of like, oh, that's cool. Like, it's cool to see that people are embracing that technology. I love it. Like I love, uh, I hate that it's become super expensive. Um, that's like, like, come on guys. Like, sure you can have this, but stop paying so much money for it because you're ruining it for the people that need to buy those things. I just, I got, I have a, uh, an Olympus stylist infinity that I got for $3 at a flea or I think it was an estate sale. Um, wow. and, one of my friends got married last year and I was, and he had always wanted one. So I was like, Oh, I'll, I'll get you one. I know this is good. Like I'm going to buy this. They're selling on eBay for like 250 bucks. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, what? Like, why, <laughs> why are you like, it's not even, you know, there, I, there are point and shoot cameras that like, I understand why they have that price, you know, like a contacts T2, your Shika T4, like those, those have really good lenses in them. I understand why, but like, there's just all these other shitty ones that exist that people are like, yeah, like because it's a point and shoot, two hundred bucks. Yeah, it's not. It's like, it's, it's, it's not the lens they're looking for. They want that filter where you it, yes. everything's black and white except for the red. That's what yeah. they want. That's what you're paying for. I, I know, <laughs> but it's like you could just you could just not pay that for right. that. Like, I don't know. I'm not a I'm not good with capitalism. I don't know. How that works. <laughs> um, I think it's cool. I think it's driving creativity in in a young generation, and I. I fuck with it. So you think it's they're they're getting more focused now instead of taking on their iPhone and quickly taking a thousand photos. You're saying they're getting more creative and taking less photos and 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 getting a different view on things, right? Yeah, because there's a price yeah. tag on it. Yeah, you know that's that's something that's always going to always going to make people be more cautious with it. You know, it's 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 a valid point. Yeah, you know when you when you get your first car and your parents bought it for you, you probably didn't treat it good. But like when you bought your own first car, you did everything you could so that you didn't oh, have to yeah. buy another one. Mm -hmm. That's right. It's like it's the same concept. You know, you're going to you're going to put way more time and effort into anything that that has a price tag on it. So in, so staying in that in that vein, I want to know what advice would you offer to these young photographers getting into the business, um, whether it be tour photography or photography in general? That to me, that's always a question that I've struggled with a lot. Cause like, I, you know, I get DMS from kids on Instagram all the time. Like, how do I do this? And it's like, I don't like, I have a lot of friends that got into touring photography and not one of us has a similar story. Like, sure. It's, you know, a lot of people are like, yeah, like I started going to local shows, things like that. But like, I mean, I have friends that their first tour was with Post Malone or like, you know, some other huge artists. And it's like, I have friends that like, sweated it out for years in vans and never became successful you know so it's 
and also like I told you, like I started on MySpace. Yeah. <laughs> That's a very different world. But I think, I mean, is it don't safe? be afraid to reach out. I think is a huge, a huge thing. You know, I know that, but also like have realistic ex- expectations that like, okay, DMing Drake is you're probably not going to get a photo pass for that. But like, whatever club you have in your local town that's you know a 300 cap room. There, look at look at what bands are coming through. Message some of them. Message some of their publicists. You know, like don't be afraid to reach out. In like in that same vein, instead of going to the artist, uh, like the venue controls what goes on there as well. Have you ever Absolutely. gone to the venue instead and like asked them, hey, can I document something for you guys so you can do promotional stuff? Like, because they always have photos hanging on the walls and stuff like that. You know, like is that another route? That is a, yes. There are plenty of house photographers. Yeah. Um, I used to, I was never a house photographer anywhere, but I made a lot of friends with the people that worked at house of blues Orlando. And there would just be a handful of times where I was like, yo, I really want to shoot this band, but haven't heard back. Like, can I come, come in? And they're like, yeah, I got you, you know? So it's like, I I've never done that personally, but I know plenty of people, you know, that I used to live in Nashville and, you know, one of the steadiest gigs that you can have in Nashville as, for, as a photographer is shooting for the Ryman, which is, you know, a very historic venue there. Um, they have a bunch of staff photographers that, that are always working there. Um, there's plenty of venues that have those. Uh, I, I've never done that. So I can't really speak on like yeah. how to go about doing that, but yeah, reach out, like mm-hmm. email them, you know, even if it's, even if it's a no, it's you're still in that person's you know email you're still right. trying yeah i think that's that's that says a lot because eventually you know so much of it is right place right time too so it's like eventually you're going to land in someone's inbox when they need it yeah but also don't be annoying <laughs> you know i don't there is a fine line between yeah. the two you know yeah definitely there's a well, I'm, I'm there was very... a guy once that would DM me and email me all the time. And then he ended up like, and I, I, to be honest, I ignored it because like, it was, it was kind of annoying, but like, also like, wasn't hurtful. Like he was just like, he would email me about once a month seeing if like, um, you know, I needed an assistant on tour, which I wish that they would have, uh, that never happened. Mm-hmm. But, um, and then like, eventually he went on to like work with the Jonas brothers just like he just kept grinding, you know? And it's like, and as soon as like, I literally was, you know, saw that, that name in a tag and I'm just like, there's no way. And it was like <laughs> looking through his shit. And I'm just like, that's the dude that you say email me all the time. And like, I don't know, like, I wish I could have helped him out, but like his persistence paid off, you know? So like, I mean, that just goes to show it's like, you have to have, it, it will be a lot of work, but yeah, it's worth it if you, if you want to do it. You know, is there like an artist or somebody at this point that, that would come to you and be like, no fucking way am I going near the photo? Like, I don't want to photograph that. Like, oh, there's plenty of artists that I've done that too. I mean, but like most, mostly just like, I would never work with them because of like, I, I'm not a huge cancel culture guy, but like, there's a handful of things that I'm just like, yeah, I, I would never work with you because of how you like the things that you have said and like, what sort of reputation I would like to hold. Yeah. And I don't, and our, our reputations don't align if for the most part, you know, um, but other than that, I mean, there's just, it's also like a big part of touring is like, it's a small world, like people wise, like there's not that many people that do it mm-hmm. and everyone talks, you know, the, the, the last tour that I just did with um, Maggie Rogers, you know, I had never, I'd never like really listened to her music and never, you know, met her before, but I know the, uh, the guy who engineered her last album. So like, I'm asking her, it's like, Hey, or I asked him and I was like, Hey, um, is she cool? Like, what's the vibe, you know? And he just had amazing, amazing things to say about her. Um, So like I took the job, 
I was like, this is great. Oh, nice. But I've also done the opposite where like I've messaged people and it's like, Hey, I know you used to work for so-and-so like, what's that like? And they'll just tell you like, Oh, well, you know, I got fired because you know, this, this, and this, and you know, the whole time, you know, they're just doing all these drugs on this. It's like just terrible vibe, you know, it's like yeah. you'll get crazy things and it's just like, okay, cool. Yeah. I'm going to say no to that. Um, so it's, it, pretty much there's just a there's a network of people that like you know if there's there's artists out there that i would never tour with solely because i've just heard nightmare stories from them Mm -hmm. so it's like yeah it's just a weird network of people that like you can ask for advice and they'll give you their honest opinion of people right yeah so i have another question that i feel like has come up in our community when it what because you know our community there's a lot of it of the members who are starting out in film making and photography and they're they they really want to you know at some point get expensive gear and how to charge for jobs what does a tour photographer um what is a good range that you can say if you're starting off you have a a simple starter portfolio something you can charge on going on a simple tour um i know it it varies on like you know how long the tour is and yeah. So, I mean, day rates for photographers go anywhere from, you know, 150 a day to 750 to a thousand a day. You know, yeah. it really depends on the size of the artist. You know, I feel yeah. like, I feel like most people that are doing um, like club level tours, you know, the, I don't know, thousand cap to 3000 cap rooms, you know, they're making between like 250 and 400 a day somewhere in that line, which is, which isn't bad. Um, but then when you get into like arena levels, you know, you obviously have a lot bigger workload, you have a lot bigger clients. So those people are charging anywhere between like 450 and like 750 a day. Um, but I know that like smaller van tours that like, and that's like, that's touring with headliners in, in my opinion, like that's where the prices live. But I know that there's plenty of bands that are, you know, opening up those club tours that, you know, you you could anywhere between like 50 and 150 a day is like fairly average just because you're looking at how much money is actually being made from the bands and that's kind of that's kind of what they can pay now let's say it's a let's say i'm curious is that for every time they're actually on stage or is it also for when they're off stage and you're traveling is that 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 part? so most most of the time it's door to door so door-to-door. like or that's that how i would charge at least is door to door so if i fly out, you know, at noon on Thursday, I'm charging for that day. If I until you come back home. Yeah. Until I come back home. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if I take a red eye that leaves at, you know, 1159 at night, I got to go to the airport at 10 o'clock. I'm charging for that whole day. Um, and then days off as well. Um, because it's like, I'm not home. I'm still working, you know? Right. That's good to know. Yeah. Are you going to be a photographer, Stefan? <laughs> I'm looking at it. <laughs> I might, hey, you man, might. It's fun. You might find me in your DMs again, man. <laughs> I'm, the, I'm the next great. guy just like, hey, man, would you need anybody for tour? <laughs> Delete. <laughs> I mean, it's so, actually, it, I, it, now's a great time because so many people exited after the pandemic. Really? Yeah, because, I mean, so many people found regular jobs that paid better or like, I don't know. It, it kind of the whole music industry shut down. I mean, I'm sure film and stuff like that was similar for a minute, yeah. but like there was, I mean, you had to do something else. Um, so, so many people found other jobs. They, they started doing studio stuff. They moved to LA, you know, they did whatever. Um, so there is, I, I feel like every week, like I'm hearing of someone looking for someone on tour for a tour photography position because they just need it. So many of like the music industry, uh, like exited during the pandemic that it's hard. How do you feel as a photographer when you're getting some of these AI apps that are taking photos and using photos to like help generate new photos that, you know, these people are asking for on, on chat GPT, for example. One question that I actually have about that is who owns that then? Like in, in the weird, you know, I mean, Shepard Ferry can get sued for doing that photo or the illustration of Obama, you know, how, 
how are we figuring out? Because chat GPT is only going to be able to pull from information that's provided to it, you know, on the internet. So you right. say like, hey, I need, you know, I need an image of the Hollywood sign. Clearly they're taking that from other people's work. Right. How is how is that tracked? How is that known? And how and how can someone have ownership over something that an AI created and you and have fair use of it? Do you feel like that's going to affect you as an artist, as a creator? For No. No. <laughs> no. There's if someone if someone is going to go the route of using AI for a job, I never had that job in the first place. True. Because they that's just what they're going to do. You if, can't you can't just AI like Sean Mendez Brazil. <laughs> photograph you probably like now can yeah, with yeah all his exactly there. like like there's not i don't know i mean i'm not saying this as an absolute i'm sure that like eventually technology can do anything yeah, yeah. um but i just don't see that like i mean we've already seen it in music you know the there was a handful of rappers that came out last year that were just ai rappers and then you know it it turns out that they were just like these like white suburban guys and everyone just stopped listening to it. Like it, it's there's audiences crave authenticity. Is that a word? I don't know. It is it now. Is now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> ha hashtag so, authenticity. Yeah. Like they, pe that's what people crave. Like that's why social media is so big and they want, I mean, whether it's authentic or not, people want to believe that these like, accounts that they follow and these celebrities that they follow is that they get to see this authentic version of them. Um, and you're, I just don't see like AI art and things like that is like, that's cool, but it's, I don't see it being, it's not authentic to a person. So how, how are mass, the masses of everyone going to mm. appreciate it? Sure. There's, there'll be a niche of it. Like, yeah, if you enjoy sure, it, people will pay for it. Exactly. Yeah, like at a certain so, point, that it's just a, there'll be an AI tour. Yeah. That's it. Like, and some people will pay for that and yeah. some people won't. I don't know. I mean, it, if you can do an AI tour in places that like bands never go to, like, Mars. that's great. <laughs> yeah. No, like, I mean, I, I grew up in, you know, a small town in Florida. The closest place I could go to see a concert was Orlando or Fort Lauderdale. And that was two hours for me. So like, if like, you could just go to a movie theater and every, every it would be full. Every single person is watching their own like specific virtual experience mm. and they feel like they're at that concert and are enjoying it. Like that's cool. That's a win because that person from that place that couldn't experience it in real life can do that. Yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I think that there's valuable sides of it, but I think that there will always be a market for the, the real version. It's like live streams during the pandemic got us like kept us going mm -hmm. and like it was cool and we all watched them and we all enjoyed it but it but we're not doing that now. Yeah. We're we're going back to concerts. So it's like there's times and places for everything but I don't think as a whole like you'll ever be able to substitute the real thing. So what advice would you offer the next generation of uh photographers that are looking to build out their portfolio and make it in the industry? Be original. I mean, original. like perfect example is like when I say I never had that job with someone going to AI, you know, if if my whole portfolio looks exactly like someone else's and that person that I'm copying is more successful, whoever's looking to hire is just going to hire that more successful person because they know that that person has that reputation. So when you're when you're creating your own brand and your own, like your own look for your images, like make it, make it what you want it to be. And don't just copy someone else because that someone else is just, is them. And they're going to get hired for that work because it's theirs. You're going to get hired for your work because it's yours. That's, that's the best advice that I was given when I was younger. And that's, I would pass that along to anyone. So Josiah, why don't you tell us about the time that you had to fake a live stream? 
Yeah, so we basically had a live stream to announce an album. Okay. And and we were in the album cover was a uh, half of um, his face and the other half was popped out with flowers growing out of it. So they hired a whole like team of florists to make this like, I think it was 10 by 10 foot um, version of the album cover out of actual flowers. So we recorded them doing it, but the it was facing like not at a 90 degree angle to the um, camera. So you couldn't see what they were doing. And it was like, I think it was like a three camera shoot. Um, so we basically got, they, they cut it live, but the problem was, is that there was just hundreds of times where the florists had a picture of the, actual final image and it was just on tape and no one noticed it like like throughout the entire it was it was 12 hours so the entire time like this is just happening and no one like so we got the final footage of it and within the first 20 minutes of the live stream it would have leaked the album artwork Mm -hmm. oh my god so so and that was the whole thing we basically were going to put this out to um to like be a whole 12 hour thing that was happening. And then at midnight is when the song got re- just dropped. Um, and that's when the whole album got announced and everything like that. So I basically got given like, I want to say it was like a th- three terabyte file of oh my God, 12 hours of 4k footage that I had to look through on a, a 2015 macbook pro um and edit out all of these times when i saw this and like i had to do this in like three or four days so i started just like i started watching on like eight times speed just to like and then i started cutting it through and i probably watched this thing like 15 times you know, just fast forwarding through finding one, cutting it out. But then it came to like, I had to export this thing. And there was like no physical time that I could, like my computer would have just exploded and shot into space. If I (laughs) attempted to export a three terabyte file on a MacBook pro, like it just was never going to happen. So I ended up like posting on Facebook about like this problem and like, who like who did i know in new york city that like had a computer fast enough to do this and one of my friends recommends me to this uh to this like editing company and he was like yeah i can i can export that overnight like who cares i'm like great so like i dropped him off a hard drive and then we basically there was a company in philadelphia that had created this was 2018 to maybe 2017. So this is when like YouTube live was like pretty, pretty new. Um, And he basically figured out how to rewire a phone to make it think that a, um, that the, the file on the USB drive was the camera of the phone. So, (laughs) He basically, like, we basically had to ship him this footage, but it turned into, like, I got an export of it, and then he needed it in a different, like, I don't know if it was, like, he needed it on Windows or, like, something like that. And all my, and my hard drive was formatted to Mac. And he wasn't going to, he just wasn't going to do it. So I had to sit in a, the backseat of a carrier's car while after I just got this footage at like six o'clock in the morning in like Manhattan. So it's just busy, you know, I'm just sitting there and the guy's like, yo, I would love to leave. And I'm like, I know it's just, it's going to be like 30 minutes while this thing just transfers. Sorry. <laughs> and he's just like, you know, this New York dude, that's just like, come on, what the fuck? <laughs> 
Um, about, sounds about and right. He hired Mike. Yeah, finally gave it to him. And then, like, yeah, so, and then it just, this guy had this, I think he, I'm pretty sure that he only operated for like a couple of months before they just like, they basically put in their terms of service that you couldn't do that. And then it ruined his whole business model. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> um, because yeah, it basically risked anyone that used his software to get their like entire account banned. So like anyone that's any sort of celebrity, like would never do that again. So it was like this weird bubble of time where like you could you like we were we I don't know I I don't think anyone of that size had ever done anything like that before like faked an entire live stream I don't know it was really cool wow really weird thing to be a part of Obviously Shitty Rigs primarily focuses on film and like film production that's where most of our submissions come in but it just so happens that like the first time we ever blew up was a photo blog so like how many like as a photographer do you do you share this kind of stuff like with your friends all the like do you guys absolutely uh, check this stuff like so i think i think one of the coolest things like like uh, honest i know you guys aren't doing this for an educational purpose like or maybe you are i don't know i think it's just for humor like yes. and fun but like there are so many things that like you know me i, I never went to school for photography i never assisted people like i just showed up to shows and took photos and then watched youtube videos about camera settings and things like that there are so many things that i've learned about the like a pro the production side of a studio because of your guys's posts like <laughs> like even as simple as like i'm pretty sure the first time i knew what like a flag was was because i saw it in a post and i was like what is that i need that and then like just started googling like white thing that you put on a c-stand and then like <laughs> flag came up and i'm like oh okay like you know it there's just so many like i was completely ignorant to that side of the photography world and i feel like you guys as like a i don't know you're you're you can only get so much out of like photographers behind the scenes because they're very secretive about like how they shoot like it's their it's their brand. Yeah, they're, they're going to be secretive of that. But like you guys, the stuff you post is just like we are production guys. Here's the here's what we built, and and it opens up like I I I probably have unfollowed them by now. But like over the years, I've unfollowed or I follow the people that you've tagged in because they're always posting about like the rigs that they have and the mm -hmm. the sets that they designed. So it's like they're it is like a level of education that is in the humor of it. That's that I've always appreciated. And also like some people just have these crazy ideas, like on how to make a fucking dolly out of something. That's right. like, you know, I love like most of the stuff that I was doing before I worked for Sean was just like low budget shit. So like, I have an appreciation for that because like, like I, the video that I shot in January with uh, one of my friends is like, dude, we had a thousand dollars to do a, four minute music video right like the first music video i ever did um had a i think it was a three thousand dollar budget and the treatment for it was me and the two singers of the band were gonna fly to japan <laughs> so like that's, that's the budget yeah there it is <laughs> that's Done. the budget i mean no literally because of that we rented um i like found a friend that like went to nyu that she let us use like one of her studio credits or whatever. So that like, we just rolled in with a metal band into like a, a NYU like set, like, or, you know, studio set. And it's like, you just found these like crazy things that like made it happen. You know, like you just, you just have to find like these random ways to make low budget shit. Mm -hmm. It's great. And you guys just have like, ideas like great <laughs> ideas <laughs> well we thank our community for that man they definitely yeah. send absolutely us some great stuff and again Josiah thanks for being here man we really appreciate you uh where can people find you how can they reach out to you where can they find your work yeah um my website's josiahvandeen.com and my instagram is just josiahvandeen that's where you'll find most of my work awesome. I am on tiktok too as well um I don't uh, I'm not really a big TikToker, but <laughs> if you want to follow me there, go for it. We'll also put all your information on, in the description below, man. But thanks a lot for being Great. here. We really awesome. appreciate your time, man. Peace. Thank you guys so much for having me. Thank you.